All right, we made it to another episode of the Upper Midwest Old Timey Listening Party. Um, it's been great fun doing this. We're on episode number 13. Uh, I hope people are enjoying themselves, learning stuff about old Upper Midwest music, and in general having a good time. I know I'm having a real, real good time. Um, today we got A.J. Shrubus. He's a great young fiddler here from right here in my hometown of Minneapolis. Um, you might know him as a person who's placed in bands at Clifftop, the Appalachian Music Festival. If you're familiar with traditional music, you know Clifftop, and um, some of his bands have placed very highly at that at that festival. He's just a great, great young fiddler, and uh, we're going to talk to him today. He's a spe specifically he's interested in that Missouri Valley stuff that's a little bit down south from me here up in St. Paul, Minneapolis, Twin Cities area. So we're going to do that. We're going to hear some old polka music on record today because, uh, you know, we usually play a lot of the home recordings, but um, lately I've been kind of interested in these old commercial recordings from the upper Midwest. So we're going to play some cool old polka music today, and we got a few more surprises coming up. We'll start off the show here. I was going to say, uh, last week we did a, did a feature on... Um, this guy named Nels Ederland, who is um, who is up in northwestern Minnesota, and we played some of his tunes, and we we're playing his tunes because his grandson Ricky ended up contacting me, and he he was talking about um, his grandpa playing great old music, and he finally sent me the tapes like I talked about on last show. And uh, what's interesting is in the last week, uh, a little tidbit that's really interesting is he's gone through, Ricky, that is, the grandson, has gone through all the episodes of this show, and he's, I think he's listened to them all now, or watched them all. And uh, during that Finseth tribute that we played, I think last week, uh, we played about a 10-minute section on uh, Leonard Finseth last week. And as everybody knows, L Leonard Finseth is my favorite of the old Upper Midwest fiddlers. We played a little section on Finseth, and uh, his grandpa was named right in there. Leonard dro name-dropped his grandpa. And what's fascinating about this this Nels Anglin guy is that he, he he didn't really play out much. He didn't play out hardly at all. But somehow Leonard knew him, and he said, "Yeah, he learned a tune from him." So I just I just found that to be a fascinating connection. You know, they're they're a state of the part, state apart. One lives in central Wisconsin, one lives in upper northwest Minnesota, but still uh, they were influenced by each other. Leonard saying even that you know he learned a tune from him, and I know Ricky has a tape of uh, Leonard jamming with his dad or something like that that we that we haven't got to yet but uh that should be really fascinating so that's all a segue for for i'm gonna play more of nell's music nell's adolin music soon um not tonight though it was a segue to say that i got really interested this week in um nell's was good friends with the Sorensons and uh harold Sorensen. uh i'm sure we played him on the show before but i've been listening to a lot of harold's stuff he's also he was right up there in that northwest minnesota area too and they were they were good friends so we're gonna play a couple Sorensen tunes to start off the show tonight first off a shotish and then the waltz thanks for joining us Thank you. 
So, so we're back here with Mary Pat, and she's the head of the Minnesota State Fiddle Association, and she's going to talk to us about a special event coming up that, that um, I think is going to be super cool, has everything to do with Upper Midwest fiddle music, as you're about to find out. So Mary Pat, tell us about this event coming up. So we're going to be having our first, what we're hoping is our first annual Upper Midwest Folk Fiddle Fest on Saturday, November 7th. Uh, some folks might recall that we were attempting to do this in May in person and of course the world changed so we rescheduled it for november and now it's going completely online so no excuse for people to not participate you can come in your pajamas um we were funded, yeah we were funded by the southeast uh regional arts council so southeast minnesota regional arts council so we we're really pretty excited about this so they're they're helping us put this on and uh this year we have um in addition of course to the upper midwest folk fiddlers i think many people have heard this group we're going to be talking about walter stoltman so if you're a fan of the show you've heard about walter so we're going to be talking about walter stoltman uh we're also going to have a group from milwaukee called the lakeside ramblers and they have uh, jason Bosniski with the group has been studying a lot of the Bruce Bolaroid um, and a lot of the Wisconsin tunes. So kind of getting the little bit more of the Wisconsin flavor. And then the group I'm in, Hoof on the Roof, uh, we have been going down the rabbit hole of what did Pa Charles Ingalls from Little House on the Prairie really play when he was in the upper Midwest. So if you may be familiar with Hollywood Pa, uh, Hollywood Pa isn't the real Pa Fiddler. So we've been doing a lot of research on that. So we're gonna talk about kind of what Pa really did when he was hanging out in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota and South Dakota. Um, so uh, so should be some interesting workshops. The three bands are gonna then do a concert and we're also gonna do a Zoom jam. So if people haven't done a Zoom jam, that's a real treat. And we're gonna focus on upper Midwest uh, fiddle tunes. So we'll have a chance just to jam on, uh, on tunes not only that we've learned in the workshops but as well as uh, tunes that a lot of us have been have been working on so we're kind of ready for just an upper midwest um you know fiddle jam i know you guys have been out there you've been practicing so so yeah so everything's virtual we're using youtube we're using zoom um uh, we'll make it real affordable if you're a member of the msfa you get a free link if you're 21 or under you get a free link everybody else it's 15 bucks for the day so Great. quite the deal great and you've kind of hinted at it but talk to us about uh, generally how the schedule is going to go for the day 
So we're gonna start at one with the workshops. So uh, what we had originally planned is that we're gonna run uh, con concurrent workshops. You'd have to choose. The advantage of going virtual is that we can, you can go to all three. So we have, uh, starting at one o'clock, we're gonna be doing the workshops. We're gonna start with the Stoltman um, tunes, then move on to uh, the pause fiddle, and then finish up uh, the day with the Lakeside Ramblers. At 5.30, we'll put on the concert. It'll be about an hour long, and then at seven, we'll have the Zoom jams. So um, a nice full day in your jammies and your fiddle, enjoying some Upper Midwest tunes. Great. Well, thanks, Mary Pat, for putting this on and doing all the legwork to do all this. I know you've been hard work at organizing this, and it's yeah. fi finally going to happen <laughs> one way or another. I so. know. So all people have to do is, um, if they want to register, want more information, shoot an email to the Fiddle Association. And our email is msfafiddlers at gmail.com, and we'll get you all the information. Great. Thanks again for talking about this and doing this event. Yeah, thank you, pal. And, you know, this is a good excuse to become members of the Minnesota State Fiddle Association, but uh, you don't really need an excuse. Anytime that you want, you can just go become a member. Um, great, great grassroots organization that's promoting fiddling in uh, Minnesota. You know, they, they sponsor a lot of great festival, or, you know, contest festivals, and uh, they're just a great, great group of folks. A lot of jams, the slow jammers come out of there. And they, you know, a lot of people learn a lot of tunes in, in, in that organization so uh go become a member if you want to um next up we're gonna have a special treat here we're gonna get into polka music a little bit we're gonna have spike Hastel and his jolly miners great name you'll about to see the picture of this band looks looks like a good fun band and uh fun music and uh, they were around back in the heyday of polka, polka recordings back in the 40s and the 50s when uh, polka music was really exploding in the ballrooms in the upper Midwest. And uh, they're a Mankato-based band. And we're going to hear from them. First one is going to be, well, you just see it when it comes up here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so that was cool there, man. They sound, they were a good old band uh, back in the heyday. Poker music. Um, that was the Minot Shottish. I don't know why a band from Mankato, Minnesota is playing the Minot, North Dakota Shottish, but there, there it is. And uh, next we got uh, their namesake, which is the Jolly Millers Polka. Once again, they have the great name Spike Hastrell and his Jolly Millers. <laughs> fine poker music there darn fine poker music um that's one of the best poker bands i ever heard i think and you know I, I, if it's old school i like it you know i mean i've learned to grow to appreciate all kinds of different music from the upper midwest you know all the different ethnicities of music they're all they all got great traditional music from back especially back in the old day you know so we want to dive into more of that into this show we don't get into enough different ethnicities of music on this show quite yet but we will you know eventually everything in its right time um next up man it's time for our interview man this is this is one hot fiddler here uh i'm sure that's why most of you are watching for aj he's a he's a he's a darn good fiddler and uh we're just gonna jump into the interview here all right it's claw hammer mike here we got aj shrubus here and he's a great fiddler from up in where were you originally from green bay I was born in Green Bay, yeah. Green summer. Bay, up in the old Wisconsin northern land there. Um, AJ, if you don't know, is uh, one of the most talented young fiddlers in the country. I know he'll be embarrassed by me saying that, but it's true. He's he's a really super good young fiddler. We got AJ in the house tonight. Thank you for coming down to the show and talking about uh, old-time music in general. Like I said, this is, this is the segment that's about... Um, all kinds of different old time music, just not old, just not specifically old time music from the upper Midwest. We're interviewing upper Midwest folks about the traditional music they play, whether it be here or there. And uh, you play, I know you play both Appalachian stuff and you play uh, Midwest, Miss Midwest stuff, Missouri Valley stuff, stuff like that. So thanks for being here. And why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how you started off playing, playing the fiddle? 
Sure, yeah. Well, I kind of came from a, a pretty musical family. My dad is a great guitar player and stuff. And he went to college, you know, in the whole kind of folk boom of the 70s and uh, was way into Irish music. And so growing up, that was what was always around the house was Irish music, like the Bothy Band, and, um, Tommy Peoples and Liz Carroll and that kind of stuff. And um, so that's just kind of the first uh, traditional music I was ever exposed to. And uh, I had played, taken some piano lessons and whatever. And, you know, my dad had tried, tried to show me some guitar and stuff. And I just didn't, I think I took to it okay, but I didn't really like it that much. And, uh, and then my dad bought a fiddle for himself when I was about 10, 10 or 11, I guess. And for whatever reason, as soon as that thing was in the house, I just loved it and just never took my hands off it. Um, he never en ended up even learning how to play it because he just couldn't get any time on it. And, uh, but I only really played Irish music. Uh, you know, I would just learn whatever I could from the CDs and records he had laying around the house. And he's, he's mu musical enough uh, and a developed enough guitar player that he could kind of help me through the technique and learn it. You know, if I was learning something, he'd say, oh, I don't think he got that wrong or, you know, so, uh, we kind of, he kind of helped me teach myself how to do it and kept me on track. And that's all I really played until I got out of high school and I went to Ireland for a while. Um, and I came home and was maybe just a little burnt out on Irish music. And coincidentally, right around that same time, my brother had got a banjo and was teaching himself some claw hammer banjo. And so I just started learning some, you know, kind of, Warhorse uh, tunes to play with him, June Apple and Arkansas Traveler and that kind of stuff, just so we could, you know, mostly because I just wanted to hang out with my older brother. And, uh, but then the more I learned about it, I was like, wow, this stuff's pretty fun. And uh, I think when I played Irish music, I think if I would have been exposed to learning from older fiddlers, you know, kind of like 78 era stuff or something like that, I think I maybe would have stuck with it, but I got into playing old time and all of a sudden there's all this older music that was just so readily available. I think that really grabbed me. Um, I had gotten a recording of Chirps around that time and Chirps played this tune on, this is kind of a funny full circle story, but he played this tune on there that was called Chasing the Banshee Away. And I just loved that tune for whatever reason. And uh, I looked him up on the fiddle hangout, you know, that like website forum. And uh, I emailed him, you know, and I said, Hey, I loved your record and the, that tune on there. Where does that come from? You know, and he writes back that he had actually learned it from uh, a 78 recording of the Flanagan brothers, you know, which was an Irish, mm. they kind of did like skits and stuff, but they played tunes. Um, and they had a, this was like part of a skit where they were trying to chase the Banshee away. And they tried different tunes and that tune at the end ended up being the one that chased it away. And so that's what he called it. It didn't really have a name. Mm. Um, but anyway, he also said when he emailed me back, he's like, Hey, I see you're in Milwaukee and I'm just, uh, you know, about an hour and a half west of there and we're having a party this weekend. Why don't you come? And I was like, okay, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I went out there and, um, they played, I didn't recognize a single tune they played the whole day. Because it was all obviously stuff that Chirps plays, you know, Illinois tunes and some Missouri tunes and stuff like that. And I liked it too, because it was a little notier and, you know, from my kind of Irish roots, it, it was sort of speaking to that in a way that I was like, wow, this is, this is cool. Um, but I didn't know any of it. And um, there, everyone that was at the party was telling me like, oh, well, you should check out this project, Dear Old Illinois. And I'm like, oh, okay, dear old Illinois, you know, and they're all saying it's great. It's a book and recordings. And I literally, I like went home and typed it into the search engine. And it like this page popped up that said, dear old, this project has ended. Thank you for your support. It was like, mm -hmm. it was like, must've been that day because uh, like even uh, Gary's nephew Cliff was at that party and like he was telling me about it, you know, so they apparently they didn't even know that Gary had put an end to it, you know. So then I spent months tracking it down through interlibrary loan and eventually got it. And I'm, you know, I started getting way more into understanding that there was this other stuff. 
yeah, during the Midwest show, we talked a lot about how people eventually found their way to uh, the Bible they used down there, that Tristison uh, book, yeah. the, the old time repertory. And um, it's amazing that almost all of them, that was kind of like, you know, eventually they found that and that kind of showed them the light. And it's just interesting how a, how a tune book can do that, you know? Yeah, do, still, yeah, yeah, still have that power. <laughs> Yeah, and Dear Old Illinois, such just an amazing book, underused, underutilized, under celebrated book of great uh, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana tunes down, down there. I've I've learned a bunch of tunes out of there. They're just they're so much, so much fun. You could spend your whole life, you know, yeah. with, like with any of these good books or or even fiddlers that are out there really old time fiddlers that know hundreds of songs you could spend your whole life with one fiddler you know or one yeah. book and uh basically still maybe not have it quite quite right you know i mean people like to be diverse and stuff like that but also just like there's something to be said for these collections of tunes that come from a region and uh they just they just hit those tunes you know so yeah uh, that neither here nor there just a side story yeah it's good to i like to see people that sink their teeth into one style and kind of really try to do that and mm -hmm. but in that same book though the christians and stuff i got around the same time just through kind of you know figuring out that there was this other stuff and when i got those christians in books i started seeing all the fiddlers that were listed in there and kind of starting to delve into that too like cyril stinnett is to this day uh, maybe one of my all-time favorite fiddlers. I just love hearing S Cyril play. He was so clean and kind of he's, perfect. He's mammoth. He's mammoth. Nobody's cleaner. Nobody's faster. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's, it's insane. What that dude can do. He was so good. You know, sometimes I just I interrupt the show. If you've watched it before, you know I interrupt the show. When somebody mentions the name of a fiddler that we just gotta listen to, we just gotta listen to. And AJ mentions Cyril Stinnett, and although this is the upper Midwest show and not the Midwest show, we're not scared to go out of region a little bit and go down south and visit Cyril. So we're gonna hear a few tunes from Cyril Stinnett here, do him some justice. <laughs> jam should not have a fade out but that's the way it was recorded next up we're going to hear a trait and how can you not like you know that last tune you know but next we're going to hear a cool tune a cool version of gray eagle we're not you know i didn't have the sound queued up so we're not going to hear gray eagle we're just gonna go with one tune from cyril stinnett that's a shame because we could listen to cyril all day let's go back into aj and talk with aj some more and then right so uh, you know some time passes and i i moved to red wing minnesota to go to the instrument school there and i was moving there thinking like oh great this can be like a year i'm just gonna hunker down and study and practice the fiddle but i'm gonna have no friends and play no music whatever well, it turned out that, you know, uh, in the registration line, I had met uh, Aaron Tacky, and then we signed a lease together that afternoon. And then a couple days after we all moved there, we met, well, actually, I put a, 
a Craigslist ad up just like looking for people that played in the area and this guy answered it and it ended up being uh, Nate Glazier who's maybe not super well known but he's a great Missouri fiddler and guitar player he'd spent he'd gotten a grant and studied a bunch under Dwight and could play all those tunes and he really just kind of I think watered the seeds that had been planted for that Missouri stuff when I you know, I had learned a few of those tunes. Like when I met him, I could hang with him on, you know, maybe 10 tunes or something that I had learned from the Christensen book, whatever. But spending that time in Red Wing with him really just made me crazy about that stuff. And we went and visited Dwight a couple of times and um, it was awesome, you know, just to get to play that stuff like every day. And and it sounds like as a youngster, you kind of had, you know, a bunch of fortuitous things happen, you know? I mean, that's, 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 that's what I've noticed with like really good musicians as I would consider you is that um, they, they're not only, you know, talented and stay with it, but they've also had a bunch of fortuitous things that kind of fall into their lap or that oh, they've, e or that they've easily chased down, you know, following leads and things trying to work together. And, and it's cool. It's cool that that happened, you know, because we, we don't have that many folks playing, you know, Dwight Lamb's tunes anymore. You know, even when I did my big show, my, when I went South and we did our big Midwestern show, you know, um, a couple of them who actually, you know, still live down in the area down there, they, uh, they, they can count on two hands, you know, the amount, especially of young fiddlers who uh, yeah. are picking up the music even today. And that's with Midwestern stuff. You know, I deal with upper Midwestern stuff and you can't, you can't find anybody still doing it today. Yeah. So it's it's, it's good. It's good, you know, that those those fortuitous events happen to you that kind of puts you on the path that you're on. And now and now who here you are today. And so what are what are your biggest influences today and what kind of stuff are you playing these days? Well, I mean, you know, I've kind of ebbed and flowed through different styles, you know, in the last several years, but I, I do feel like in the last maybe three or four years, I've really basically been targeting trying to learn just Missouri stuff and kind of, I don't know, you know, that obviously there's some different styles in Missouri, but I, I wouldn't say that I've been married to any particular thing, but I still just really love Cyril Stinnett, really. I mean, I use him kind of as my main source for the, that upper Missouri stuff. And then, um, also, Lyman Enloe and Gene Goforth, I think I would put really high on my my list of just where I usually go to learn a tune or most of the tunes that I've tried to learn. And and then like um, we haven't mentioned yet, but Al Murphy, meeting Al Murphy then uh, some years ago, I guess maybe three years ago, has been really cool because he uh, spent a bunch of time with those guys and he's still around. So he has all the stories and, you know, he got it. Uh, some grants through the uh, state of Missouri to go, or I guess, I don't know, I guess I don't know if his grants were through Iowa or Missouri, but he got some money to go hang out with them and record them a bunch. And he's been really generous with me and shared a lot of that stuff. So. Um, and, and he's still around and he lives in Iowa and you've hung out with him a few times. Have you, what kind of insight have you picked up from him? Since I didn't get to meet Lyman and Lower Gene Goforth or something, it's fun to talk to him about more of their personalities and stuff. And because mm -hmm. he was around, you know, for that time. I mean, Al's interesting because he's the age where he was young enough to still be here, but old enough to hang out with those guys, you know. And um, the other thing I like about Al and Lyman and Gene is they were all kind of spanning the gap too of like coming from maybe backgrounds of playing breakdowns and dance tunes, but they also were around a lot of bluegrass and stuff. And I think, I don't know if it was a product of them liking it or if it's just because the people they had to play with also played bluegrass or whatever, but um, I like that sound a lot. I like like breakdown fiddling with bluegrass backup is super cool. And the first time I heard that, I was just like kind of lost my mind, which was the Lyman Enloe recording.
and it's great that you know you found what few resources we still have left up here from what we consider old timers you know um i don't know if they would consider themselves old timers but the al murphy's the dwight lambs the folks like that so what particular tune do you want to uh concentrate on today and uh why is it important to you uh, a b flat tune which i just love playing in b flat i think the fiddle sounds really cool in b flat it's kind of challenging, so I, I I like that, and I just think the tunes are really pretty. And um, Cyril Stinnett played tons of great B flatters. Well, anyway, I was thinking I would play Letty's Hornpipe, and uh, the one little story I have about that is I can't remember exactly what number birthday it was, but a few years ago, Dwight Lamb was at Lanesboro, the Bluff Country Gathering, and he was staying in that. Red Hotel or whatever, you know, the one like right on the main drag, there's that room right on the main drag. And it was his birthday. I, I want to say it was his like 82nd or I can't remember whatever it was, but it was his birthday. And uh, they were staying there and, um, you know, John Everest and uh, Bill Peterson were with Dwight and they were all parting down in that room. And uh, I had spent a while there and then kind of went out to just go see what else was happening. And before I went to bed, I was like, well, I'm just gonna stop back over there and see what's going on, you know, if they're still at it. It was probably like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., you know. Uh, sure enough, they're still up. No one was really playing any music. They were just sitting around talking. And and I, so I come in and sit down and, and Bill says to me, he's like, AJ, hey, you know, don't you play that Letty's Hornpipe? And I said, oh yeah, I love Letty's Hornpipe. And he's like, I think you should play it for Dwight. It's his birthday, just, you know, just play it a couple times through for him. You know, it's like 3 a.m. or something. And Dwight's sitting on the couch and he's got a little glass of whiskey and John comes in and he says, Dwight, you want a, uh, do you want another uh, drink and a little more whiskey? And, and Dwight says, yeah, I'll just take two more fingers. <laughs> you know, just like they filled the cup up for him. And so I played that too. And, and then um, Liz Amos, I don't know if you ever ran across her, but she's just a, a powerhouse, awesome fiddler. Well, as soon as I started playing in B flat, she busted her fiddle out and we played in B flat for like another hour and a half or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dwight hung out while we serenaded him on his birthday. But anyway, Letty's was the one that um, sparked that. I always just thought that was a pretty cool moment. story and what's your second tune that you want to do well then the other tune i was thinking just because um you reached out to me about al and uh, i was thinking i could play a tune that i did learn from him that's called uncle herm's tune and 
Uh, that is a tune I had heard before. Like, I think the first person I ever heard play it was John Ashby. And um, I, I, I think a lot of kind of Virginia fiddlers play this tune, but um, Al plays it and he learned it from Gene. And I, just before we got together here, I went back to look at my recordings and uh, Al made a bunch of recordings of Gene at Gene's house in 1991. And this was in that batch. And you're talking about Gene Doleforth right Gene now, Dolphin. right? Yeah. And uh, it's the same tune as, you know, how most of those other people would have played it. But he does kind of mix up the notes in a way that I think is really interesting. And Well, thanks, AJ, for being with us. Our final question is always, um, you know, what, what stuff are you working on right now? And where can we find your music? One of the first and easiest places to check out would be uh, Steam Mach steammachinemusic.com. The um, Steam Machine album is up there, a few years old now, but um, yeah, that's that anyway. And then um, Rena and I are kind of working on a little duo project that we hope to record and put out at some point here in the near future. And um, I would say probably just keep your eye on Facebook or even the Steam Machine information. We'll probably use that sort of as a platform to announce it. Um, and then um, I sometimes I try, I've been trying to get better about it, but my YouTube channel, I've been working on a little bit, posting some lessons and just tunes on there. And um, I hope to kind of do that a little more. I, I feel like putting stuff on Facebook is reaching a place where like, it still doesn't even reach so many people because the algorithms have gotten so weird that I kind of want to um, maybe nurture my YouTube uh, page a little better just to put stuff on there. But um the other thing I've been working on lately is playing some bluegrass, which is totally unrelated to upper Midwest music, but um, I like it. And so uh, if you have any interest in that, the uh, band is back up and push and we'll probably be posting stuff on our website there to back up and push bluegrass.com. So that's kind of my focus these days is the arena project and the bluegrass. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for being with us today, and thanks for spending time and catching catching up with. Uh, I don't, you know, it's just personally, I don't get to catch up with some of my uh, favorite musicians too much. So it's great to great to be able to catch up with you today. Thanks, yeah, AJ. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Bye bye. See you.
was fun catching up with AJ and hearing from Rena. We hear her on the chat right now, but uh, we didn't actually interview her. We probably should have got a few words in with Rena too. My bad. Rena's cool, cool in her own right. You know, works tirelessly in the old time scene for um, Minnesota old time music. And uh, appreciate her. Appreciate AJ. It was great to have them on the show. All right. Well. I think we're going to go now to, uh, you know, I've talked a bunch on this show, switching gears, you know. I talked a bunch on this show about um, this fellow named Thorstein Starning, who uh, was one of the great band leaders back in the day. Um, him and, uh, you know, there was Selma Ramsey, and, you know, on the German side, Whoopi John. There were several just great upper Midwest band leaders, and Thorstein was one. But um, And I've heard a lot of Starning tunes, but I've heard them played by other people. And this one's going back, way back, I think I want to say like 1918 or something, and we're going to hear from Starning himself here. get a clue why back in the 20s and the 30s everybody was crazy in the Midwest about upper Midwest about Thorstein Starning's band because uh, he was a good player thank you guys a lot for listening to the show tonight it was great fun great fun hanging with AJ hearing from AJ and Rena and listen to all we talked we got to talk to Mary Pat a little bit about the cool upper Midwest folk fiddlers festival that's coming up online very soon and uh yeah it was it was a fun episode if you want to support the show up here it's paypal is unarmed journal at hotmail.com venmo is at claw hammer mike um you definitely feel free to watch it for free but if you want to help out you know the show does take a little bit of effort to work we're going to close out with thorstein starting here a nice slow one called seasons coming Kind of ominous, just like the titles. Very ominous, just like the tune is. So, thanks much, y'all. See you next time. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 